Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to the Department of Media, Communications, Creative Arts, Languages, and Literature. Um, this is a McCall Voices event. Uh, we are going to talk about contemporary trends in Asian media research. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which this university is situated, the Walamatagal people of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to the Darug people and the Walamatagal clan. We also wish to acknowledge the elders of the Darug Nation, past, present, and future and pay our respect to them. Um, welcome again. So this, uh, this is a McCall uh, research event in collaboration with the Asian Media and Culture Research Group. Um, this event is part of McCall Voices uh, 2023, Crossing Borders, a series of conversations on international research and experiences of scholars and students uh, of McCall. Uh, we are exploring some questions such as uh, what are the opportunities and challenges in doing research across national and cultural boundaries? What are the current trends in international research? How to navigate life and career as international students, uh, as international students and global researchers? Okay, so let me just check uh, the audience in the Zoom room. So thank you very much for uh, those of you who are joining us here um, at the drama studio. This is the drama studio of uh, the McCall department. Um, and thank you for those of you who are joining us uh, via Zoom. So here uh, we have um, our esteemed colleagues. Um, we have uh, Sarah Keith, Tom Bodinet, and Mayfen Kuo, who will share their research on Asian media and culture. Um, some questions that we will explore are, what are the trends, uh, latest trends in Asian media and culture today? What flows and what does not? Uh, what has been neglected and what needs to be further explored? How do we challenge assumptions of a singular Asia? What are the values of particular frameworks, um, transnationalism, inter or trans Asian studies, Asia as method, when we research cultures and communities in Asia and uh, the Asian diaspora. So I'm going to read uh, the bios of our speakers today. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Sarah Keith. Uh, Dr. Keith um, uh, focuses on research uh, around e East Asian contemporary culture, particularly Korean popular music or K-pop as a global music genre. She is interested in intersections of popular music and expressions of national uh, or cultural identity and the complexities raised by global cultural flows. Sarah also researches disruption within the music and creative industries, including technological innovations economic change, shifts in cultural policy and globalization, particularly discourses of technological progress and creative empowerment as a foil for centralizing power and consolidating capital. And we also have Dr. Thomas Bodinet. Uh, he is a senior lecturer in Japanese and international studies. Um, his research focuses on the role of Asian popular culture in informing knowledge about gender and sexuality across East and Southeast Asia. His first book is Regimes of Desire, Young Gay Men, Media and Masculinity in Tokyo, published by University of Michigan Press 2021. His second book is Boys Love Media in Thailand, Celebrity, Fans and Transnational Asian Queer Popular Culture published by Bloomsbury in 2023, this year. Um, he recently completed the Academy of Korean Studies funded project, K-pop Fandom as a space for LGBTQ plus support in the Asia Pacific during pandemic times. And lastly, we have Dr. Nathan Kuo. 
Um, she is a lecturer in contemporary Chinese culture and history, embarked on her academic journey by transitioning from journalism to history in Taiwan. With a keen interest in identity politics, she pursued a PhD in Asian studies at La Trobe University, delving into the narrative identities of Chinese Australians in the early 20th uh, century. Prior to her current position at Macquarie, she conducted extensive research at Swinburne University of Technology and the University of Queensland. Her focus uh, lies in exploring the interplay between Cold War sensibility, print culture, and Chinese Australian identity politics. She is also the recipient of 2023 National Library of Australia Fellowship. So uh, welcome, Sarah, Tom, and Nathan. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us insights today. So I would like to begin with the first question. I'm going to ask our speakers some questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience here and uh, at home or um, wherever you are uh, who, who are joining us <coughs> through um, via Zoom. So first, I think um, the bio, uh, uh, each bio has given us uh, glimpses of your research, but maybe you can tell us more about you and your research. What made you decide to focus on um, uh, Asian media and culture research? So perhaps we could start with Sarah. Thank you, Intan. Um, so my background is in contemporary music. And in my undergraduate years, when I was studying contemporary music, much of it, although not all of it, was fo focused on the Western popular music canon. Um, of course, there is there are fields like ethnomusicology, which examine um, other forms of music outside the Western mainstream. But generally speaking, there hasn't been much attention paid to, um, uh, or at least there hadn't uh, until more recently, been a lot of attention paid to non-Western popular musics. So having grown up in Asia, I knew that there was a lot happening outside of the Anglophone world when it came to pop music and pop culture. Um, and in my early uh, research career um, with Professor Diane Hughes, together we were looking at uh, things like uh, Taiwanese popular music, uh, how indigenous Taiwanese singer-songwriters were expressing their cultural identities. We also did some comparative studies of Japanese, Korean, and ta Taiwanese musics. So I've been sort of observing K-pop in particular for more than 10 years. And I've seen it evolve from the pre-Gangnam style K-pop in Australia, where it was really more of an underground phenomenon, community radio, CD, and DVD shops, um, into something that has become much more mainstream, facilitated by the internet and so on. And it's still an, ob an object of fascination to many, the fact that Australia is the importer of Asian media and that you know it's a kind of reversal of this innate cultural hierarchy that we seem to have. Um, and that's really something that I'm still kind of interrogating and looking at. And I think it's fair to say that the K-pop industry is a global pop industry unlike any other. Um, it really innovates particularly with technology and how it produces things. And it's something that has um, really fascinated me and driven my research. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And what about you, Tom? Um, so my academic journey actually begins, I guess, more personally as a fan journey. Mm -hmm. So encountering um, various forms of uh, initially East Asian popular culture um, and how that when I was an adolescent. So I have this, this story that I often tell about encountering by complete chance when I was around 14 years old in a public library, a Japanese manga comic um, that I now know was part of a broader um, subgenre called boys' love, which focuses on these kind of handsome, beautiful men falling in love with each other, and has this long, vibrant history as as both a a kind of female-oriented popular culture fandom, but also as a queer resource for for those uh, from the LGBTQ community, both in Japan, outside of Japan, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and globally. So I was a fan of that particular media and that led me in my undergraduate to begin studying Japanese language 
and then Chinese language and then Korean and I just became increasingly interested in the role of these popular culture forms. Um, K-pop, another one. I'm a huge K-pop fan as well. Um, indeed, I draw upon a lot of Sarah's work in my own scholarship, so it's great that we're here together. Um, but this idea of how, how consuming this vibrant media out of East Asia provides alternative narratives to, um, within the context of East Asia and Southeast Asia, you know, the, the kind of heteropatriarchal norms that circulate within those societies, but also how they, um, within their transnational circulation, provide resources for those who are looking for alternative expressions that may challenge or subvert the quote-unquote normalcy of the West. Um, and then, as I've been increasingly working with Japanese popular culture um, in doing a PhD, doing kind of work as, as a staff member here, I also began to transition to focus on the role of Japanese popular culture and then Korean popular culture in shaping queer media in Southeast Asia. And that really just emerged through two serendipitous occasions. One, my encounter with um, boys love adaptions within the Thai context, and this became my ultimate fandom, more so than Japanese and Korean stuff, so it's a very personal journey. But at the same time, connections that I made through my fan and academic networks with scholarly and fan colleagues in the Philippines, in Thailand, who provided me avenues of collaboration and support that completely radically opened my mind to the, the power of looking at these flows from the Southeast Asian context. And I think that that was a really transformative moment in my thinking. So it's a fan journey, but an academic journey at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. What about you, Megan? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm a historian and my journey is begin, uh, my research is uh, particularly focused on identity politics, and which is related to my personal experience when I grew up in Taiwan. So in Taiwan, uh, what does that mean to be a Chinese? That is a quite important and very critical question for my generation. So my journey is pretty much is to answer that question, but I dig with the historical inference to think about our, our identity. So I bring that cover in uh, research into uh, to Australia. So I begin to do my research focus on Chinese migration in Australia, particularly in early 20th centuries. And also, uh, when I begin this research, uh, back to that time, not many people uh, uh, use the Chinese language material to understand the voice from the Chinese community in, you know, in, in Australia. So somehow that is also create my the other research institute is to uh, build up the engagement with the community and to dig their voice to be listened to uh, our child society. And that is also linked to me, you know, how I uh, bring up that kind of the research from Chinese print culture to Asia media. And so through this, you know, when I'm doing this research, I begin to have opportunity to meet the families and to the community organization. And I begin to show quite a lot of material, you know, from them. And with this collection, I begin to think about their diverse voice and experience. It's quite hard, you know, not just, you know, just label them, you know, you are Chinese. I find it's more interesting, you know, to see how this kind of the idea of Asia to bring in, to redeem who they are, and also it's quite interesting to see. Uh, so my research, particularly in the beginning, I focus on early 20th century, but because of this family, they share their story, their collection. And I slowly just bring to the year during the Cold War period, and that's really interesting period. And you can see a lot of in engagement, a lot of connection, not just in Australia, not just in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, but also through, you know, the Southeast Asia. and. Somehow also um, my current uh, research focus on the, during the Cold War period, how Chinese community rebuild or reshape their identity on Chinese, but also how they con contract the idea about Asia. So somehow uh, this kind of my personal journey bring me to the interest on the Asia media and culture. Thank you, thank you so much. So it's uh, quite interesting how I think uh, the diversity of um, background and also consumption um, uh, plays an important role in your research. Um, the Last McCall Voices event focuses on uh, uh, cult scholars and how 
travel and um, cultural encounters uh, shape uh, uh, their research. So it's quite interesting to find the similar themes here. So we've talked um, about uh, the flows um, in terms of the, the flows of Asian media in Australia, and, and Tom is uh, a fan, definitely. Uh, and also, um, the flows are definitely part of the um, uh, consumption uh, among ch uh, Chinese Australians, uh, perhaps. Um, so I guess my next question is about how, uh, about the trends, the current trends in Asian uh, media uh, and culture research today. So um, Asian media scholars often focus on global cultural flows, um, particularly to respond to highly visible global cultures such as Hallyu. Um, do you think this is still uh, the trend in media uh, and culture research in Asia? Um, and if we pay attention to what flows, then what doesn't flow? Um, perhaps we could start with Tom. Um, okay, I, what's really interesting is that I recently um, had an article returned from review that um, I was talking about soft power flows and the, the reviewer comments, which were pretty positive, were wanting me to explain more about what I meant within this context. So I, I throw my mind back to one of my last conferences as a graduate student when I was still at, at Monash University completing my PhD. And I, I gave this kind of my initial first ever presentation about the Thai media that I'm now well known within the academic and fan community to speak about. And I said then back in 2015 that Thai media will be the next K-pop, that it will, will become the next big thing. And everyone thought I was insane. Like, um, and now, you know, I've, I had an article um, that I contributed to in Harper's Bazaar. I've been interviewed by The Economist specifically on these questions. It's formed a really big part of my scholarship. So this idea of how um, there are these constant um, cycles, if you will, of, of waves of popular culture that, that kind of build upon each other. We can historicize that, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but what's been particularly interesting to me, looking at the emergence of a transnational fandom for Thai boys' love and Thai popular culture more broadly, has been how that has been shaped by um, an industry within Thailand that has borrowed from some of the innovations of the Korean popular culture machine, if you will, and then added um, what I argue is specifically queer effects. So they they're targeting this desire for queer representation, uh, but also siphoning this fan practice where people reimagine celebrities in, in romantic male-male or female-female relationships. And they've transformed that into the, the driver of this new, what, what some of my colleagues in industry um, partners in Thailand refer to as the Thai wind, which is going to blow away the Korean wave. Um, and like, I think that's quite interesting. But in my attempts to theorize this, I've actually moved away from what I think has become the axiomatic um, wave pattern of trying to understand um, media flows in Asia, because I'm, I'm much more interested in, which, in the ways in which these media processes and these, these flows, if you will, have become diffused. So one of the big arguments I make in my scholarship right now is that um, we shouldn't be looking for centers from which media culture is kind of emanating um, but rather we should be looking at what colleagues in Singapore, the, the Inter-Asian Cultural Studies cluster referred to as Inter-Asian Referencing, and in so doing we can then destable the hierarchies um, by basically revealing that the hierarchies are always already unstable. So I found that quite productive in my attempts to destabilize or perhaps more naturally denaturalize the idea that, for example, Western queer media is the, the most legitimate and authentic form of queer media because my work on Thailand and this creation of this diffused fandom across the world has destabilized that. And the, the idea that fans then produce their own affective, their own emotional worlds through that diffusion that is often grounded in resisting the Western narratives has been quite important to me. So I guess in that way, I still participate in that broader scholarly project of denaturalizing the West, but I've become increasingly, I, I'm very POMO, so I'm very postmodern um, in my approach here. So I'm not necessarily a, a kind of Frankfurt School-esque kind of structural thinker. I, I like to think more from the bottom up, and I think mm -hmm. that that's what Asian mm -hmm. media culture provides me the opportunity to do. 
probably too long. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. great. Uh, thank you. Uh, what about you, Mayfan? Yeah, I follow up uh, Tom's idea, decentralized Western. And I find the other three is uh, the centralized China, <laughs> so mm -hmm. particularly yeah. in the China. Okay. Uh, Chinese diaspora study, that is always the debate, the connection, the transnational connection with the homeland, with the China, or image or cultural China. And so uh, that is a very, that is already a very significant scholarship on the Sinophone studies, so try to rethink about uh, the, the bigger China, Chinese diaspora community, all the diaspora community with the Chinese heritage, how they rebuild the connection with their homeland. And I find that one is quite interesting to, to rethink in a couple of ways. Uh, one is to, to, to rethink the rule of the media uh, in the shipping of the community. And, and, and that also help us to have the opportunity to rethink uh, like Tom said, from the bottom up, rather than just think about the, the, the central, you know, the nation state and the policy, the government's power, how they influence the media and how they build up this, uh, the sense of community. But also the people from the bottom, they also have that kind of agency to build up that kind of the sense of a community, and which I think is quite important uh, for us to recover the voice we, we really to hear in, in the last, for in the last we particularly focus on narrative, you know, from the EDA level, from the one that who have the uh, power, you know, to assess the network or the language uh, ability, but how about other people? So I find this kind of trait is quite important to rethink about, you know, what other people, and also think about the local experience, mm -hmm. you know, how they can respond to this kind of the global, global uh, combination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then what about you, Sarah? Yeah, I'll just briefly add to the excellent points that Tom and May Fan have already made. Mm -hmm. um, so I was reading a book earlier today that was published in 20, uh, sorry, 2008, um, and it's by, edited by Chua Benkwat, who's one of the IACS people. And even 15 years later, reading that book seems quite quaint because it does identify these very specific local hubs of cultural production, mm -hmm. which don't make sense today. Like Tom was saying, you know, the new Thai wave has elements, sorry, Thai wind <laughs> has elements of the Korean wave in it, and we are seeing these kinds of endless recombinations and recursions that kind of, you know, this is cultural studies 101, but kind of muddies the water of what is considered the kind of local authentic versus the global. Um, for me, I, I find that contradiction itself really fascinating to unpack. Um, again, K-pop is endlessly rewarding for these kinds of questions. So taking the example of something like, you know, a song that is written by an international songwriting team produced by a, um, sorry, performed by a multinational group, performed at an American Music Awards ceremony. How can we say that's K-pop? It's so global. And yet at the same time, it is um, deliberately branded as Korean. So that kind of tension between the material of culture and how that culture is branded or marketed or understood is something that's really interesting to me. And the last thing I'm going to say is there's a turn of phrase that's often used by um, K-pop industry people called um, cultural content. Mm. And I like the idea of thinking about cultural content as well as culture because it makes culture more material. Mm. And then we can think about how cultural contents are sold, consumed, distributed around the world as things with a kind of materiality to them, um, which I think is, has been really useful for my understanding of culture. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, have a look uh, in the chat if there is any question. Um, so for those of you who are watching um, via Zoom, you can uh, write your questions uh, in the chat, and uh, there will be a Q&A after this. Um, okay, so thank you very much for all the insights. Um, I'm uh, taking notes furiously, um, <laughs> you know, very important concepts regarding decentralizing um, the West or decentralizing China, um, you know, uh, thinking through communities, local hubs. Um, I think you've answered the, net, the, the <laughs> question number three, uh, but maybe we can just um, uh, uh, go back to this. Um, how do you view Asia in Asian studies and Asian media culture uh, and culture research? Um, I think we, we you, you've answered a little bit, but I would like to hear more. Um, 
especially we'll, we'll start with Maven because I think you, you really um, questioned the idea of, of Asia through your research uh, around um, Chinese diaspora in, in Australia. Uh, is Asia an idea we need to constantly unpack and interrogate? How does your research challenge assumptions about Asia? We'll start with you, Maven. Yes, yeah. uh, I guess I'll answer your question beside on my own uh, research uh, during the Cold War period. And what, because now I'm particularly interested on how the uh, so-called Chinese community in Australia, I find it's quite uh, problematic uh, uh, to call this group as the Chinese mm -hmm. because they come from Southeast Asia, they come from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and probably uh, this this label is not useful mm -hmm. to to say to say to name them. But I also find uh, so during the Cold War period, uh, the community also tried to find a new neighbor. And interesting is that is influenced by the student from Southeast Asia. They begin to call themselves Asian. So which also is quite interesting, and I also find that it's a very contained idea about Asia among the local community, how mm -hmm. they name themselves as Asia. For example, the language they choose to represent Asia. So the particular the student come from Southeast Asia, they use the Asia uh, to, re to represent themselves. They choose English. And the reason they choose that is uh, they think that it's useful for them to communicate to each other, but also to divide themselves from the local old Chinese community in Australia. And which is quite interesting, and then the local Chinese community, they begin to use the Chinese language to say this could be unified, the Chinese, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in account for the sense. So I find it's quite interesting, even from the local community's perspective, they also find Asia maybe is, uh, I think it depends, it's sometimes it, during the, uh, they, they f sometimes they find they will use the Asian to uni unify themselves, but sometimes they also find there's quite problematic meaning behind this Asian uh, contact. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we haven't really talked about Southeast Asia and how that can also um, disrupt the idea of um, Chineseness, <laughs> for instance. Um, how about you, um, uh, Sarah? Yeah. Um, I mean, I find the concept of Asia kind of shrinks and expands and moves around over yeah. time, um, especially with, you know, how the Australian government chooses to define Asia and Asia priorities and that sort of thing. Um, I kind of see the concept of Asia as useful from outside Asia, but not from inside it. Um, one example might be if we speak about um, Asian Australia or Asian Australians, we can speak about, you know, an Asian Australian identity. but I. At the same time, I'm aware that, that that elides a lot of difference within, let's say, the uh, Asian Australian community. But at the same time, um, there is there is a community there, and there is an often a shared sort of sense of identity. So I think it's a term that can be interrogated, but I think for some purposes it mm -hmm. is useful. Um, and espe especially, you know, being in Australia, there there is a kind of concept generally speaking of Asia as um, you know the other or something that needs to be addressed in policy or you mm. know as an economic uh, concern or things like that so it does have its uses but I think um, the closer you get to Asia and within Asia it starts to kind of lose a little bit of its its meaning mm. thank you Tom I think you know, to address the, let's say, the white elephant in the room, which is, of course, me, the white elephant. You know, my, my background is as, as an Anglo-Celtic slash French-Australian, right? Um, so to me, I come out of that, that history and, and that cultural milieu in which Asia is the other. Asia is not us, if you will, where us equals white Australia. And that means that my own reflexive journey and, and kind of relationship with this concept of Asia. You know, I, I try not to define it too much because one, do I have the right to do so as, as the white elephant in the room, as I said. Um, but analytically, that sense of difference can then be transformed into something quite analytically useful. And I, I do this a lot in my work, but it's also reflecting on my own personal journey that my engagement with East Asian popular media and then Southeast Asian popular media, my travels and, and, and living in Asia, whether that be Tokyo or Manila or Bangkok, um, have been so radically transformative. I, I talk about it, you know, I'm a queer theorist, so I'm interested in, in structures and, and like de deconstructing and, and tearing apart 
common sense knowledge and, and a lot of that common sense knowledge is grounded in Western European and North American in kind of knowledge systems. So engaging with Asia as the fictive other has allowed me not to other Asia, but to utilize Asia in my theoretical world building in my own personal journey to then challenge what I've always assumed to be the truth. And then that is exactly what I do in my teaching here at Macquarie as well, because um, you know, I, I teach a Japanese culture, Japanese language, literature, history to our students here and who come from a variety of different backgrounds, both Asian, Australian, um, white, Anglo-Australian, or a plethora of other ex-Australians. And like, I like to utilize Asia as, as a kind of starting point, not to say, you know, West versus the rest, but to say that actually all cultural forms are somehow constructed and there is no true universal norm, really. Um, and hence, it becomes a, a, a site for thinking through these problematics. So, yeah, I may be teaching about Japan in doing so, um, but it, it becomes a provocation, I think. So that's how I like to think about these terms. And then, of course, there's always the, the, the broader kind of, let's say, Cold War history of area studies as, as a kind of extractive process of learning the enemy. <laughs> and we all live under that umbrella when we work on, in so-called Asian studies. So there's also this element just that I, I constantly think through. And I don't know what the answer to that problematic would be right now. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for um, this conversation around the constructedness of Asia or any um, category of, of cultures. Um, and I think I, I do agree that we need to ask the question of the usefulness of the concept and, and for whom. Um, but before we continue, maybe uh, I would like to ask the audience here or um, uh, on Zoom whether they have questions. Not yet? Okay. Um, if not, maybe I can ask the next question, but please let me know um, if you have uh, burning questions for our <laughs> uh, speakers. Oh, okay, oh, okay, okay. Right, this is um, a question from Andrew Alter. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so this is a question for Tom, perhaps. I'm intrigued by your use of the term denaturalizing the West. Is this sort of another side to the decolonization push? I was wondering if you could elaborate whether I've understood your use of the term denaturalization correctly. Okay, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, I got to listen to Andrew put on a fantastic gamelan performance yesterday. Um, so just another kind of instance of a, a colleague here at McCall doing fantastic Asian studies related research. Um, so my, my use of this term denaturalization actually comes from queer theory, um, where queer theory as, as a theoretical approach within the, the broader humanities and social sciences and, and cultural studies is, is really about, as I said, challenging um, the, the fixity of knowledge and, and the idea that certain regimes of knowledge, for want of a better word, or certain ideologies are somehow natural, i.e. they are correct and a priori always there to describe the world. So within classical queer theory, this has often been used to refer to the systems of, of the gender binary and compulsory heterosexuality, but we can also then utilize that, that questioning and, and the unraveling, if you will, of these su supposed um, common sense notions to denaturalize them, i.e. to provincialize or to reveal their constructedness. So the argument being um, that within these fixities there are inherent kind of tensions that if we kind of tap at them gently even, you don't need to go in with a sledgehammer, the whole concept will collapse. Now that also has a political relationship to decolonization and this actually prefaces a question that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later that, um, with regards to my methodology. So it is, it is actually um, related to Andrew but slightly separate from I would say, just coming from different theoretical traditions. But, but uh, it is, I mean I'm committed to a decolonizing as well um, and I think 
Yeah, that's that's what I mean when I say denaturalizing, because I, I, I make a distinction between the theoretical process of revealing these these inherent contradictions versus the political act of of challenging them. And and for me, the political act is the de is the decolonizing, um, whereas the the theoretical act or the theoretical process is the denaturalization. Yeah, mm. that's probably too scholarly, but that's that's yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. So I guess just following up on that, um, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the theoretical frameworks uh, that might be useful when we approach Asia. Um, so, you know, you've talked about uh, denaturalization um, and there's also decolonization. There are some other concepts such as transnationalism, um, inter-Asia, trans-Asia, Asia as method. Um, so uh, these uh, terms have been helpful to understand um, um, Asian studies research, uh, but um, what about you? Um, what frameworks uh, that are useful for you for, for your own research? Maybe we can uh, continue <laughs> with Sarah. Okay. Um, all the frameworks you've mentioned have been really helpful in terms of framing my understanding of Asian popular culture. For me personally, I am not an adherent to one particular framework. Um, and that might also be partly because I'm not really working in the Asian studies milieu, but across the kind of media music milieu. Um, so I come ag again back to that idea of defining culture, not as an immaterial concept, but as a something material. So there's a there's an ongoing trope in critiques of K-pop, which is that it's not really Korean. Um, John Lee, who's a Korean American sociologist, wrote a article some time ago, where is the K in K-pop, i.e. what is Korean about it? And his supposition was that there was actually nothing Korean about it. Um, but again, if we think of cult, um, culture as cultural content that is produced within frameworks of particular countries, societies and histories, state support and control, technology and capital, then I think the idea of culture becomes a lot clearer to me. It's not about the sort of the object itself, but the circumstances of its production that I find most interesting. So I think that's that's really been something that's guided me with understanding how how to approach the idea of, of popular culture. Thank you. What about you, May Fan? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Interesting thing is, uh, as Tom already highlighted, uh, this kind of Asian study or Asian culture, when when it begins, have like kind of have a quite strong impact from the Cold War period, and how they shift the culture should be back to the time. You know, it's quite strong uh, tool to 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 support ideology conflict in the in the region. And so somehow I find uh, now we study the Asian study or uh, Asian media. Somehow we need to unpack the kind of the strong impact in the region, how we shape the culture. So I find, uh, for me, it's quite useful from work would be the cultural practice theory. And more think about in the lived experience, how in a local context, people still have like, uh, agency or the creativity to re to re-engage and to reshape the culture for themselves. And which I find is quite useful for uh, for me to dig uh, some voice. We really to hear from in the past, all we think that like, is not so important, and we really think to, to think about the cultural, um, you know, from past to to present. And the other I find is quite interesting, and I'm still struggle to find a very good way to 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 an analyze is about emotion, how how we deal with the people's emotion, and how this shift to their community building, back to the history, and particularly I'm, I'm a historian, and we find. I find it's quite challenging, and but particularly I find, you know, the the mediology, you know, from cultural study, from sociology, even from diplomacy, you know, from soft power, it, it gives us some ideas, you know, how we can deal with people's emotion or something. We can't really see there's no really evidence, you know, hi historian can find in the archives, and with that kind of the uh, uh, farm work or mediology can help us to understand more how people experience during that cultural thing. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, one question from Catherine, but do you want to add, Tom? Um, I just wanted to, I, I realized that I did, did 
a bit of a disservice with this idea of denaturalization by only suggesting that the thing that I'm denaturalizing is the West. Um, I would also say that my media studies work also denaturalizes the local knowledge systems as well. So within the context of Thailand, looking at the rise of, of a queer media form and how that challenges Buddhist inflected notions of familialism and heteropatriarchy. So that's another difference between those terms, decolonization and denaturalization. But theoretically, I'm quite committed um, to a, a political slash scholarly movement known as Asia as Method that once again comes out of that um, IAX space in, in Singapore, um, first seminally kind of defined by um, a scholar named Kuang Xing Chen. Um, and he calls it as a method that is towards de-imperialization. So he takes it even further than, than pushing back against colonization, but he's also using it as a way to resist the contemporary neo-colonial imperialist kind of um, structures that shape the, the, the kind of global moment today that are born out of the Cold War system, that are born out of the, the kind of the age of imperialism in the 19th century more broadly. So this is um, my political process. I, I am a queer scholar, so I'm an activist scholar. And what I have felt in my own personal life through the ways in which Asian media has, has challenged my understanding of the world and provided me emancipatory futures. I write a lot about how Asian media for various subjects in East Asia, Southeast Asia, here in Australia, operates as a, a, what I call a resource of hope to push back against systems of oppression and, and produce utopian futures um, and, and emancipatory feelings. I write a lot about feelings as well. Um, and, and I think that this Asia as method approach, it isn't necessarily a concrete methodology or research design, but it's more about a political commitment to centering Asian knowledge as the source for knowledge production rather than treating Asia as, as a kind of laboratory for the testing of Western theory, which um, particularly in my home discipline of anthropology has been very, very common, particularly within like sub-disciplines like dev development studies. Um, you see it a lot. So, um, you know, we'll apply some Western theory or method to fix the problem in the Mekong Delta or something like that. And that, that's the kind of thing that just gives me a massive ick reaction. So it's a, it's a commitment to pushing back against that kind of thing. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So I'll go to the next question. This is from Catherine. Um, oh, uh, there are two questions, actually. One for uh, Thomas. I'm also interested in your dealing with your otherness in Asian studies. I have worked consistently with Hazara community in a performance project with one Hazara writer and two non-Hazara or European writers. This can be complex to negotiate. Do you have any writings about your methodology or processes for working with non-European communities? So that's uh, one for Tom and the other one is for uh, Mayfen uh, from Catherine as well. I believe you mentioned the difference between how research is recognized from non-Western institutions versus hegemonic uh, dominant culture institutions. What strategies are challenging this currently? Okay, maybe um, Tom can go and then we'll go to Mayfair. Which Catherine is this? Catherine Parker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just like, there's a few of them. Um, thanks for the question, Catherine. Um, so, um, I haven't written anything systematic as a methodology paper um, personally, though it is scattered throughout my works, particularly that forthcoming book on boys love media. I, I spell out in one of the sections my commitment to Asia as media, critical Asian studies, and my positionality vis-a-vis -vis that. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm an ethnographer at heart. I work together with communities and and um, you know I interview them, I participate within those communities, I learn from them. Um, and hence, from that process of learning, that dialogic process of learning, I, I'm able to, as I said, look at my views of the world, have them challenged, and then produce a theory that is grounded in the views and values of the community with whom I work. That involves rapport building. Now, I work with fans, and I work with fans of media that I am myself a fan of, so even though I come from a different background, I am able to connect through that effective relationship to media that is often a good way to break the ice. But if you don't necessarily have that, it's about finding other ways of rapport. And, and, and really, this goes back to good, reflexive, anthropological practice in my mind, which I'm teaching to um, our master's students, for instance, 
this idea of that you are not um, some kind of armchair or pith helmet wearing external observer. You must embed yourself within that community and that re revolves reflexivity, respect, and being willing to learn from their communicative norms, their social norms, and, and adapt to them. I don't use the word adopt because I think that that's problematic, but adapt to them. Um, and it's that, that constant process of reflexivity. So, so I, I have no, let's say, guidelines on how to do this effectively because I think it's a case-by-case -case mm. kind of situation. But it's about willing to put yourself into a position of discomfort and then um, embrace that discomfort as a site for generating rapport and, yeah, just kind of changing your worldview. Because all, all research should be transformative. And I think that it doesn't just transform the world, it transforms the researcher as well. So mm. I, don't, I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, Catherine, but it's the best that I can give. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. Um, I think if, if I may add a little bit, uh, I find that uh, Linda Tahewai Smith's uh, oh, yes, method, yeah, yeah. <laughs> decolonizing research methodology, is very useful just to think about our own political yeah. position in dealing yeah. with our subject. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, OK, Absolutely. so next uh, question for? Yeah. For Nathan, uh, yeah, I just want to uh, double check if the question is about a challenge. Yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll repeat this. Um, you mentioned the difference between how research is recognized from non-Western institutions versus hegemonic or dominant culture institutions. What strategies are challenging this currently? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, Then I just um, I thought you were sort of saying that you are, are con you are dealing with this with your research a lot, uh, uh, but I may have mis misheard it because it's a little bit hard sometimes to hear over the Zoom. But did you say that um, you know that you are still kind of dealing sometimes with the recept you know how your research is received in depending where it's published? I might have heard Did that. Any of us mention that? I, uh, I guess I, before I think I'm talking about, I'm struggling to find uh, the approach to, you know, can really talk, uh, talking about uh, how people experience the Cold War area, and particularly back to that time. Uh, due to the elimination of the document the archives be available and I find it's quite difficult. We, we can really understand how people really experience the Cold War period. Mm. And particularly during that time, uh, for my research, the people experience a quite dramatic um, uh, feeling, emotion, emotional and also the traumatized experience during the Cold War period. And somehow I find for a historian, you know, my, my training before from institutional <laughs> training, <laughs> Uh, we didn't be trained to deal with this kind of the, 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 the thing. And so somehow I find I'm still think that is quite in, important for us to understand how people experience during that time. And we don't really talk about this. And somehow I think um, now the, the, the last trait of you know, the Asian culture or Asian media study really bring us back, it bring that emotion back to, to the research. And for a historical study, I think uh, I, I, we begin have some uh, scholarship is quite good. They begin to rethink about the, uh, you know, the effect, you know, the emotion, how this can shape the community. Mm -hmm. But I still think we still long way to go, you know, particularly for historical studies and how we can integrate with other methodology to to better understanding, uh, to to have a better understanding on people's experience. But I guess your question also made me to think about. The challenge, you know, uh, particularly for Asian studies in Austria today. So before I thought you were asking me about this question, I think that's a pretty important question. Mm, yeah, a comment from uh, Jane Hanley, or how Chinese language historical sources have been incorporated into Australian historical studies or not incorporated. Mm, yeah, when I begin my research and um, I begin to use the Chinese language to, to, to think about the Chinese community in Austria and how they uh, fight against the Huaozhou policy, the, the racialism, back to that time. And then through that time, I think it's an in, increasing 
a uh, scholarship particularly focused on Chinese language material to redeem community or redeem identity politics. I would be very surprised, you know, uh, the story, the diverse story, and how people redefine their heritage and redeem, you know, what Australia should be. It really made us to redeem, you know, what Australia, what, what Australia look like. Mm -hmm. It's not the one we, we think before. Mm -hmm. And that local story, that diverse story really, I think we really, you know, transferred our thinking about Australia's position in Asia. Mm. Okay. Um, let me see if people here have questions. Yes, Fabian. Okay. When you talk about the concept of Asia, or the, uh, anybody in the back, right? so when you talk about the concept of Asia or the concept of Asian cultural production and popular culture, where does the Indian film industry, which includes Bollywood, sit within this broad umbrella of a Asian cultural production? Do you think there's a stark difference between cultural production in Southeast Asia and South Asia, or are there any overlapping elements? Yes, what about the South Asian context? Anyone would like to answer? I'm not a South Asianist, <laughs> yeah. so I can't, I can't necessarily answer that question um, confidently. Um, but I think that within the, the context of, I, w I was having a fantastic conversation with a, with a hopefully soon to be Emirates student in our department about how they wanted to do research comparing the fandom and celebrity cultures of um, Tamil Nadu with um, what happens in South Korea and, and how the, there are these kind of um, fandom cultures that on paper look very different coming from very different um, kind of, let's say, production contexts and production his like historical contexts and cultural contexts, but how um, they, they have a, a kind of similarity, particularly in, in their gendered form. Um, I think that Look, I, as I said, I'm not a South Asianist, and I admit that both South Asia and Central Asia are weaknesses within my, my um, broader experience, and, and that there is a need for more dialogue between these, as, as well as so-called West Asia as well, um, that, that needs to be brought into this. Um, but yeah, I, I can't answer the, the, the specifics of your question. Um, but I, I'm aware of people who are doing work in that space and I can possibly shoot you their details. Hi Fabian, I have to also say I'm not a South Asianist. Um, we should really have Andrew Alto on this panel because yes. <laughs> uh, he's the expert here. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But I will say that the little I know about the South Asian and Indian film industry is that it's again very distinct. Likewise, India's music industry is unlike any other, um, highly linked to its film industry. And I guess, uh, as a casual observer, I've been seeing more and more Indian blockbuster films break through into the mainstream, Triple R being the main, yeah. um, <laughs> the main one. Yeah. So I don't know, we've had the Thai wind, Korean wave, we need the Indians yeah. fire, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the, the elements. Yeah. Um, that might be something worth theorizing in future. There is actually a fantastic book out from um, the, the Pop Asia series at um, University of Hawaii Press that explicitly looks at Bollywood and Hallyu together, um, which, as I said, I'll flick you those details. It's a fantastic book um, that just kind of teases apart how they do look so similar. But one of the things that I think is important um, to as a caveat for that book is that they do tend to focus a little bit on... on the diasporic aspect of those mm -hmm. phenomena um, rather than the non-diasporic. So Indian diasporas and Korean diasporas and their relationship to it rather than, yeah. But um, fun note, Triple R in Japan was promoted by an, a male idol group from their massive factory, idol factory of Johnny's and Associates. So like there's this kind of weird connection um, with, with the idol industry of Japan promoting this blockbuster Bollywood film, and yeah, and I, I haven't even thought about how I would, would tackle that yet, but it's there, it's there. Maybe we need people to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, well, I'm not a speaker, but <laughs> just to add a little bit, looking at it from uh, the Asian cinema context, uh, definitely uh, the study of uh, Bollywood has a long history in Asian film studies and even in, in the Asian film studies discourse, um, the challenge is actually um, how to make uh, Southeast Asian cinema more, more visible. So perhaps it really depends on um, you know, where you look at it. Um, 
in terms of uh, visibility. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> anyway, uh, we have uh, five more minutes. I wonder if people have um, any um, uh, other questions. Okay, <laughs> or uh, okay, maybe I would like to um, ask um, any of you, um, uh, anyone who has uh, thoughts about um, the position of Asian studies in, in Australia and what we can explore more at Macquarie University. I'm often on record as saying, and I think I've already said this, that I'm very much against what I call the extractive mode of studying Asia. So looking at Asia purely for the purposes of its economic exploitation mm -hmm. within a Australian kind of, um, let's say, strategic defense mm -hmm. or strategic IR context. Um, you know, I go back to that, that famous white paper in 2012, Asia, Australia in the Asian Century, which was just about building up Asia literacy in order to exploit Asia for Australia's um, economic kind of imperatives. Um, and I, I think that that's a really dangerous road to take. And I think that here at Macquarie, certainly in our Japanese studies program, whilst we recognize the, the kind of obvious you know, material benefits of, of the, the kind of relationship between Australia and Japan in, in both security and, and trade and so forth, it's not about necessarily transforming our graduates into extractors, it's about turning them into collaborators. Um, and I think that that's really important. Like I, I just kind of go back to that question that Catherine asked. The answer to, to I believe, to that, that question of hierarchy is collaboration. And I know each of us here collaborate with our colleagues in East, Southeast Asian institutions, um, industries, and, and community groups um, here as well. Um, both Mayfin and I have relationships with community groups as well. I'm sure you do too, Sarah. Um, and, and like this is how we kind of need to move forward and, and not treating Asia as, as the dangerous or scary other, but as that other, and I think that othering can be useful, but I don't mean it in a, in a kind of negative sense. I mean it in a transformative sense. And, and that, that knowledge should not be extractive, it should be collaborative, and it should be about producing things that are of benefit to both of us, if that makes sense. That's not very eloquent. <laughs> So uh, for uh, the last the last statements, <laughs> maybe uh, Mayfan and Sarah, uh, maybe you have more to add. I'll just quickly mm -hmm. throw my two cents in from someone who's not technically in Asian studies, but um, I just want to acknowledge many of my colleagues, including yourself, Intan, of course, who are consciously looking beyond the kind of Anglosphere and Western canon in their teaching and also shout out to Andrew Alter for whom I give a guest lecture on K-pop. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, so I think um, more and more we're seeing knowledge of Asia become mainstreamed in, you know, in, in our kind of concept of, you know, from where I'm standing, what media is, what music is, and so on. Um, so as well as Asia studies, Asian studies being a discipline unto itself, um, I also see very positive signs that we are thinking about Asia um, as, as a part of our curricula, more generally. Mm. Nathan, you have more to add? Yeah, I guess uh, I would think we also need to carefully think, you know, ac how academia define the Asian studies, but also how the people, the local community, how they think about themselves and how they practice to use Asia to build a connection to, to the other like, region. Yeah. Mm. Okay, um, there will be uh, more information about um, the Asian Media and Culture Research Group next time. Um, Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but uh, we are running out of uh, time, so I would like to um, just thank Sarah, um, Mayfan, and Tom for their generosity. Um, thank you so much, and many thanks to Mike Weber for helping us with the um, tech uh, support. Um, and thank you everyone who are coming here today. Thank you everyone for um, uh, your uh, questions on Zoom. Uh, see you in the next uh, McCall Voices event. Thank you. Thank and you to uh, Intan for her brilliant sharing and organization, of course.